Good evening, Neil. I'm going to ask you to just um, go ahead and start the webinar. I see that the sound has not converted on this video, and I think most of our audience are familiar with the platform, so you are more than welcome to start. Okay, good evening everybody and thank you very much indeed for joining us. Uh, we're absolutely delighted uh, this evening to be uh, doing this webinar on the veterinary, uh, the F10 uh, applications for veterinary treatment in relation to uh, wildlife. Um, it's um, Great pleasure for me to uh, be working this evening with Dr. Karen Lawrence and with Dr. Katja Kopel, and I'll be uh, introducing them formally to you. Uh, those of you who have seen these webinars before will be aware that normally Cornet would be introducing me, which is really the best way to do it. Uh, but unfortunately, she's not very well this evening, so uh, I've been asked to introduce myself. So I'll kick that off. Uh, my name is Neil Falls, a veterinary surgeon based in the UK, but spending as much time in South Africa as possible. I qualified from the Royal Veterinary College in 1983. I'm a diplomat of the European College of Zoological Medicine in the avian subspeciality. Also a Royal College of Veterinary Surgeon Specialist in Zoo and Wildlife, brackets avian. And I also hold a fellowship of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons by examination in exotic bird medicine. I was responsible for teaching avian medicine at Bristol Vet School from 2001 to 2011. Um, I've lectured internationally for many, many years. I con contributed to more than 76 peer-reviewed uh, internationally uh, referenced uh, papers and more than 37 books. I've received a number of national and international awards. I'm the past president of both the uh, European College of Zoological Medicine and also past president of the European Board of Veterinary Specialization. I left clinical referral practice uh, in 2017, but continue to provide consultancy service in zoo, avian and wildlife sectors. And I undertake local, local authority welfare and licensing inspections, as well as acting as a zoo inspector in both the United Kingdom and Ireland. In my spare time, uh, I do much more important things, uh, and that's uh, to do with conservation projects, uh, both things like hen harriers in the United Kingdom, but perhaps more importantly, vultures in South Africa. Um, and that's why, you know, we, we've had a, a number of these webinars previously, but, uh, and obviously we all understand that commercially, um, small animal exotic practice is, is really commercially more important. But in terms of where we can make a difference with the application of F10, then uh, wildlife uh, is, is really where my heart is. So I'm delighted to be doing this this evening. So next to introduce Karen Lawrence, um, otherwise and, and more formally known as Dr. Pangolin, um, Karen is the uh, founder, director and head veterinarian of the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. She qualified in 2002 and started her veterinary career um, Sorry, I've lost my, lost my uh, veterinary career in small animal practice. She developed an interest in wildlife veterinary medicine in 2010, especially wildlife rehabilitation. She opened a veterinary hospital with wildlife rehabilitation specialist Nikki Wright, therefore combining a veterinary facility and a wildlife rehabilitation facility uh, all under one roof, which, you know, obviously we all understand those to do with wildlife is, is really crucially important. One of the species the hospital specializes in is the Temminx pangolin, and Karen has gained extensive experience in treating and rehabilitating this species and has recently completed her MSc research degree, gaining a distinction, and that was in February 2020, on the normal reference intervals for clinical chemistry and hematology in the Temminx pangolin. Dr. Karen is co-author of Chapter 29, that's the Veterinary Health of Pangolins in the book Pangolins, Science, Society and Conservation, recently published by the IUCN. And, that, you know, that is a fantastic accolade for anyone to have. Um, Dr. Karen is currently the most experienced veterinarian worldwide treating this particular species of pangolin. She is passionate about conservation and has worked with more than 250 indigenous species of birds, mammals and reptiles, obviously based at the Johannesburg Wildlife Hospital. She's working towards opening a teaching facility for veterinary students and nurses interested in treating and rehabilitating small and medium South African wildlife. So a great pleasure to be here with Karen tonight. And then the third panelist is Dr. Katja Kopel, uh, who graduated from Glasgow University in 2000. She 
moved to South Africa in 2002, completing her MSc in wildlife in 2004 from the University of Pretoria on probiotics in cheetah. After working in private practice, she joined Johannesburg Zoo as veterinarian and then later as head veterinarian uh, until 2015. She received her diploma from the European College of Zoological Medicine in Zoo Health Management in 2015. She started at the University of Pretoria and is currently Associate Professor in Wildlife Health. She is passionate about conservation, especially rabies and black-backed jackals, and One Health. She is the veterinary advisor for the Mabula South Southern Ground Hornbill Project, and she's currently president of the South African Veterinary Association Wildlife Group. So we have a fantastic uh, panel group with us this evening, um, and uh, it, it gives me great pleasure, um, and I'm really excited to be uh, undertaking this webinar with you all this evening. So just by way of introduction, I'm going to explain that um, I have a role, uh, I'm delighted to have a role as veterinary advisor to health and hygiene. I've used F10 products myself in practice for more than 20 years. I have great faith um, in the efficacy and safety of those products. So what makes F10 different? Well, firstly, we have safety testing of all finished products by government accredited quality controlled laboratories for both skin, oral, dermal and inhalation safety. We have efficacy testing, again, of all finished products. And this is the important thing. It's not the active ingredients one by one. It's the finished products. And that stands us apart from a lot of other people. Again, those efficacy tests are carried out by government-accredited, quality-controlled laboratories. There is considerable information, not only testimonials, but also that all the safety and efficacy data, application instructions, and much more is all full disclosure for all uh, users to refer to on the F10 website, which is provided for you there. Just just one thing I forgot to mention just before we, we move on. Um, if any of you uh, attending this uh, webinar, um, if English is not your first language and you'd be more comfortable with a translation, then if you go to the, U the Health and Hygiene YouTube channel, which is given at the bottom of this uh, first slide here, that gives you the ability to have a simultaneous translation in a language of your choice whilst you watch the webinar. So do please take advantage of that. So as I say, we've got all the tests and the efficacy data, the dilution rates, and, and most importantly, the contact times. It, it, it never ceases to amaze me as I'm going around doing inspections in zoos and, and other animal-related establishments. And uh, I ask people, you know, what disinfectant they're using and what is the contact time? What is the dilution rate? And certainly in, in terms of contact time, very, very rarely do people actually know what it should be. Uh, let alone stop to consider whether that is practical for them in their own situation. So that's all available for you on the website with the links here. Our application guidelines again with the links there. So Health and Hygiene provides added value to all products across its range with training and education of distributors, clients and users with this and similar presentations together with the comprehensive fact-packed website. And again, just going back to the YouTube channels, of course, if you're watching this uh, particular webinar as the first one, of course, you can go back onto the YouTube channels and see all the previous webinars that we've done. And we will be adding uh, d d with a lot more webinars uh, to, for, for different applications in the forthcoming months. Okay, so during the course of this presentation, I, I'm going to may break a little news to you. I'm not going to do all the work. Uh, we do expect you guys to uh, firstly stay awake and, and do contribute as well. So we've got some polling questions for you here. And um, the first one is, um, uh, and, and the instructions on this polling is to answer all options which are correct. And um, the first question is, you, are you aware of F10 and use and you use at least one product on a regular basis in your own facility. Question two, question B is I only use F10 products for cleaning and biosecurity. Question three, question C, I use F10 products for disinfection and also for patient treatments. Question D, I wasn't aware that F10 products were licensed for patient treatment. 
and question E, I use F10 by fogging on a regular routine basis. So if you can all poll away and uh, we'll see um, how those uh, results stack up. Now, I'm not actually seeing the, the polling, so hopefully everyone else can see how the polling is going. Um, Hi, Neil. So um, I see about 41% of our audience have chosen option C. Okay, good. 20, Excellent. 28 has chosen option A, 14% option B, 13% option E, and only 2% says that they weren't aware that F10 Okay, okay. I think that's interesting because those results are showing that during this course of these webinars that actually there's been a, a gradual trend and progress to people knowing more about the different applications of F10. So that, that's really great news. Okay, well, thanks everyone for doing that and we'll move our way on. So just as an introduction into wildlife, I just pose the question, why is wildlife so different? different. And first thing to point out is that, of course, all wildlife patients have essentially failed the fitness for life test. In other words, they failed to survive unhelped, unsupported in their wildlife environment. Um, although often, of course, we accept that their failure is often due to anthropogenic reasons. So in other words, they've flown into power cables or trains or cars or lorries or fences, things that we've put into their environment. So uh, so that, that's the starting point. All our patients are stressed by being in captivity. These are patients that, that are used to being uh, free living and are naturally scared of being close to humans. So the fact they're in captivity, they've got to have got really poorly to allow themselves to be caught up. And, and equally, they are very stressed every time we go and look at them, handle them, let alone medicate them. So they're super stressed every time we treat them or handle them. So as far as we can, we want to do hands off. We want to prevent and control uh, problems before they arise so that we don't have to medicate them more and we want to use as infrequent treatments as we possibly can because they will cope with that much better. But at the same time it's important to recognize and share with you that 70% of new human diseases come from wildlife. COVID of course is a great example. Um, so it's really important that wildlife do get treated, their diseases do get investigated but equally, of course, those of us working with wildlife have to be very, very careful not to become infected ourselves or worse still, to pass on those diseases to those around us or release them back to the wild if it's going to cause a problem in the ecosystem. So that means that infection control and biosecurity are super, super important in this particular situation uh, because of the risks that are posed to ourselves and to the wildlife populations. So if we now go to polling question two, and we just ask, what are the key attributes which make F10 so good for us to use in wildlife cases? So you just have to answer one of these. It's, so it's the, the one most appropriate quest answer that we want you to select when you do your polling. So A, F10 products are super safe and efficacious, so all products may be used in all wildlife species. Or B, this statement is false as F10 products must be used with care in wildlife due to the potential residual environmental effect. Or C, F10 and other health and hygiene products have exceptional efficacy and safety with broad spectrum activity against viruses, bacteria, and fungi. And we need to consider both the known pathogens and also the unknown pathogens. They are often appropriate for intermittent use and have no residual environmental effect and may often be delivered by fogging or nebulization with minimal intervention or stress to the patient. Or D, F10 is safe and effective for use by nebulization, achieving a beneficial systemic effect akin to a broad spectrum antiviral or antibacterial in most species. Or E, 
F10 delivery by fogging is beneficial in controlling endogenous contagious infection in patients. However, increasing the humidity in the patient's environment is typically disadvantageous. So if you guys can, can poll away and we'll see what you have to say. So I'm not sure if you can see the poll results, Neil. Um, I, I can't, I'm afraid. Is there something okay. I, can, I can do to help I, me do it? I think maybe you should also cast a vote and see if that will help. So sorry, sorry do what, Corne? Yeah, to, so cast your vote and see if it gives you the results. I, I don't get an option to cast a vote. Okay, then you think I, I've got no, vote, <laughs> no voting coming up on the screen at all and no results on the screen. No, that's fine. Um, so we've got about 31 votes in out of our audience. Um, it's climbing slowly. 53% has chosen option C. Okay. 22% D, 19% A. Okay. So those are your top three, C, D, so and A. We'll just run through those. Um, A. Uh, F10 products are, of course, super safe and efficacious, so products may be used in all wildlife species. Well, you'll hear later that there is one group of wildlife species, and that would be the feline species, where there is a potential, certainly a, a need to be more cautious. So A isn't completely right. Um, B, this statement is false, as F10 products must be used with care in wildlife due to potential residual uh, environmental effect. There is no there is no residual environmental effect. That is a completely wrong answer. Question C is is a nice answer, and uh, sorry, answer C is a nice answer and and completely correct. So that that's a good one there. Um, answer D, F10 is safe and effective for use by nebulization, achieving a beneficial systemic effect. No, that's not true. Uh, there isn't a systemic effect, um, but of course, the, there's an effect on inspiration, um, eyes, and, and the skin, and so on. And E, F10 delivery by fogging is beneficial in controlling endogenous contagious infection in patients. That's true. Um, however, increasing the humidity in the patient's environment is typically disadvantageous. That is incorrect. Generally, increasing the humidity within reason is, is normally beneficial, particularly when they have a respiratory problem. So C, C is, the, is the good answer, um, but I can understand why people say A is, is uh, uh, relevant and applicable. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to be handing over to Karen. Um, and so I'm very grateful that Karen is with us, and she's going to be talking us through um, the, the uses and applications that she's had with F10 at the Johannesburg Wildlife Hospital. Hi everyone, hi Neil, um, thank you. Uh, I can hear myself actually, I don't know why. <laughs> Hang on. Um, so if you see my dog pop up, up every now and then, he's decided to lie on my lap um, for the first time ever while I'm talking, so Ozzy will be part of the talk tonight. So for me, um, I'll just put one slide on. For you guys that don't know, who we are, um, the Johannesburg Wildlife Veterinary Hospital. We treat small and medium indigenous wildlife, um, those without owners. So things that you might have hit by with, a, with your car on a road or flew into your window or mitigating human animal conflict, especially when it comes to things that live in your roof like genets or bats. Um, we get animals from all over the country. Um, uh, they get flown to us by a very nice group of people called the battleurs who fly wildlife for free. I'm sure Katja knows them too and, and Neil. Um, now our goal is to release them back into the wild as a fu fully functioning part of, of their species. Um, it's a bit different to zoo in general wildlife practice for me. Um, for me, zoo animals are often habituated to humans and you can teach some of them how to receive treatment as listened to uh, Michelle Barrows the other day about her, how she treats um, uh, her animals to come closer to get uh, treated or um, you can, the, the keepers can be, can be, uh, can tr uh, train the animals how to uh, take uh, oral medication or injections, fairly easy. General wildlife for me is more of a herd health approach because things like rhino and, and elephant, you can't really keep in a little, um, an enclosure and treat every day. Um, so it's sort of a, 
a hands-off approach, more of a hands-off approach. So you treat them and, and see what happens and, and maybe see them once a week or even uh, with longer periods in between. Wildlife Rehab Vet, Vet, um, Veterinary Center for us, it's for me, it's more like a small animal veterinary medicine practice because we can work up cases more um, thoroughly. Uh, we have blood test machines. Um, we, we culture our, our um, abscesses and wounds if we can. So it's more of a, a medicine and um, more of a, uh, what is the word? Um, Hands-on approach. Um, even though they are wild, <coughs> we can do a little bit more than, the, than with animals that try and kill you, like um, rhino and lion and elephant. Uh, oh, by the way, sorry, let me just go back. That is a southern white, um, African um, white-faced owl that lives in my garden. His name is Fred, and he has decided to move into the spotted eagle owl nest I have or box I have up so which is I'm super excited to see their children okay so, so the most Karen, thing, Karen if I can just jump in there I think the the last yeah. point on that last slide which you had there but didn't actually mention is it, just so so oh, important yeah, yeah, yeah. that that whilst you can do that scientific stuff in taking swabs and doing cultures and getting the right treatment the, the big difference between small animal practice and wildlife uh, practice is that those patients hate you they hate yes, they being do. handled. I mean, yes, you can anesthetize them or sedate them in order to do that diagnostic process. But even the treatments, and if you know if you're having to do them uh, on a regular basis, it is so stressful for them. So it's it's yes. a it is very different to small animal practice. But yes, it's fantastic to have the opportunity to apply yes. the science of diagnostics and therapy. Yes, Thank we you. do try our best to minimize handling if we can. So things that work yeah. longer, yeah. safer um, to use, we we definitely do use. So for right. us and our hospital for we use f10 for surface and floor disinfection you know i i grew up as a vet it sounds silly but i grew up as a vet in the last i've been a vet for 20 years this year um i grew up with f10 and uh there have been other products coming along but i i'm still using it because i trust it and no i'm not paid by f10 to say this i really do like the product we do start to sterilize our consumables like feeding tubes and, and things in between patients um, the skin preps we use for venipuncture and surgical procedures. And we have a lot of wounds that, that we treat. Um, and a lot of animals come in with wounds, especially cat bite wounds. We see it on a, a daily basis almost. And F10 for us is a quite a useful product for that. We use it for fly strike prevention. I'm sure Katya will talk about that too, because <clears throat> you treat wildlife and you put them in an enclosure and the next day there's flies and maggots and it's a, it's a horror show. <clears throat> and obviously for hand hygiene as well. Um, we sterilize, uh, for, especially with COVID now, um, people coming into hospital has to stay um, sanitize their hands. So, so what we do use is the F10SC diluted, a one in 250 to clean the wounds. Um, I love the wound spray with the insecticide. Um, again, the insecticide, like Neil mentioned, not in felines. Um, um, I'll get to the pangolins a little bit later. We use the barrier ointment a lot, uh, <clears throat> and we also use the barrier ointment with insecticide, um, especially because things can lick it and not die. So small, luckily birds don't normally fiddle with their wounds, but we have had birds that do that. Um, and then you have this pink everywhere on their faces, but um, it's safe to use in birds as well. I often use it, um, and I'll get you a couple of cases where I've used it. So Karen, yeah. just to interrupt, with th things like the, the hedgehog that you have there, yeah. How often are you actually doing the treatment? Um, it depends on the wound and how dirty it is. Um, and the hedgehogs are fairly dirty animals themselves. So when they are in a, um, a sort of a cage environment, they do poo everywhere and get themselves quite dirty. Sure. Sure. Um, so if it's not that bad, and we can get away with just using the ointment or spraying it and not have to sedate them every day because obviously they curl into a ball and there's no mm. way you can get yeah. to that wound. Sure. So yeah. it's every second or third day, depending on the wound. Yeah. Um, obviously, they would be on other antibiotics as well, yeah. um, pain meds yeah. and all these things. But the, the sort of the sedation will do every second or third day to get a good clean in um, because obviously you can't get to the wound. But the ointment work, where, where uh, the insecticide ointment work very well here because they are one of the ones that get fly strike really easily mm. um and there's the you'll see there's a photo later on of them the flies lie their eggs in between the quills oh. and it's almost impossible to get them out 
So if you have the, the spray then on the quills around the wound, that keeps them away. Thank you. Okay, our first my first case. It's mostly case studies I'm gonna do. Um, just to see to show you guys actually how fantastic wild up is, is at the healing. So this is a yellow bolt kite. Um, just so you know, the picture on the left is not the kite in the in the rest of the pictures. It's just to show people what a yellow belt kite looks like, because not everybody's seen one. One thing to mention here: yellow belt kites are intra-Africa migrants. So normally, um, sort of like April, Mayish, they bugger off, or end of March really, they bugger off to mid-Africa somewhere. So when we get these animals or with these birds in, it's actually quite um, important to get them healthy before they have to migrate, because overwintering wild birds that migrate is not really nice. They hate it, they stress, their whole body tells them to migrate, and suddenly if you keep them over winter, they don't like it. <clears throat> this was the case with this bird as well. So you'll see the wound in the middle. It was, we suspect, a barbed wire fence that she flew into, um, and it's really quite nasty. You can see all the tendons, and you know most people would see this and think eh, it's not gonna work. So, <clears throat> We admitted her on the 26th of February, 2018. Um, we cleaned the wounds with F10. Um, again, it's safe. I We applied F10 germicidal or barrier ointment and insecticide in the beginning because of the flies. And I'll show you a, a nice picture now. We used a stent bandage because of that area being so movable. And you also don't really want to bandage a... Um, a bird's wing because the joints become really stiff and then that proposes a whole nother problem afterwards where you have to do um, physio to get them flight ready so we wanted to put something on that wouldn't keep the wing um, in a in a bandage position so i'll show you the stent bandage in a second but if you look at this uh, this was day four it's really quite horrific looking very lovely tendon there in the middle you know you can see the bruising on the left side on the top um and obviously this is also on antibiotics and pain meds and all sorts and fluids and and we had her on a drip in the beginning because she she had been quite ill so the, before i show you the other picture she was successfully released on the 23rd of april um 2018 so she stayed with us for about two months and she was perfectly flighted when she left um just to show you that what we did the first one is that stent bandage so what we would do is because that needs to stay moist at all times. So the ointment works really well for that. And in the beginning, I also even soaked those swabs in saline just to keep them. We would change them every set day or every second day. I know it's stressful, but you can see she wears a hood, which helps a little bit in birds. Um, and we did it so you, you guys that work with large animals will know the scent bandages. We made it so that we could uh, take it off and then replace it and just um, tie it with the big loop sutures. And that was about six weeks after the um, after we did it, the one in the middle, and then one on the right is what it actually looked like at the end. And there was no contracture, and that mo um, that elbow moved freely. The potassium was perfect. Um, so for me, this was quite a a, a success story because we all it, thought she was uh, never going to fly again. Yeah, it's a yeah. it's a staggering success. If you look at the severity of that wound, you see the um, the the soft tissues all melted away from those tendons and things. And and to think that that all closed in, and the bird was flying normally without any effect on, as you say, elbow function and propotagial function in just a two month period. You could release her. That is a staggering success. That's really really impressive. Yeah, for us it was great. And oh, as also we use the F10 insecticidal spray a lot in the beginning because sure. obviously with flies. And you can see we didn't stitch that wound. We it's no, second no. intention closure. No. It's, it's yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, fantastic. Very good. Lovely. Okay, so if I just go through this next polling question, um, and the question is, which one statement is most accurate in respect to the use of F10 products in wildlife patient respiratory disease? So A. F10 SC1 and 250 in saline can be used to treat respiratory disease in any species by placing the patient in a room with a fogging machine which delivers the F10 fog. 
or B, and, and again, this question is just answer the, the, the one most correct answer. B, if F10 is applied by fogging or nebulization, the area should be well ventilated for 30 minutes before staff re-enter the room in case they have an adverse reaction to the F10. Or C, F10 SC1 and 215 saline should be applied by nebulization, generating a particle size of 0.5 to 2 mu so that the particles are carried as far down into the respiratory system as possible. Nebulization should be conducted three times a day for 30 minutes, typically for a five to 10 day period. Or D, F10 SC1 in 215 saline should be applied by nebulization, generating a particle size of two to five mu, so that the particles are carried as far into the respiratory system as possible. Nebulization should be conducted three times a day for 30 minutes, typically for three to for five to 10 days. Or E, F10 SC1 in 250 in water should be applied by nebulization, generating a particle size of 0.5 to 2 mu so that the particles are carried as far into the respiratory system as possible. And nebulization should be conducted three times a day for 30 minutes, typically for five to 10 days. So if you poll away, and then as before, we'll just discuss those options as to which is most appropriate. Okay, so the polls are coming in a bit slowly. So we've got about 23 polls or 23 votes in. Front runner so far is option C. Good, good. 76% followed by a three way tie between A, D, and E. Okay, all right. Um, well, nobody's just... chosen B so far. Okay, so let's go through it. So the option A, F10 SC1 and 250 in saline. Now, just to discuss whether it should be in saline or in water, um, it doesn't have to be in saline at all, but just simply because it's being breathed deep into the respiratory system, it probably is slightly kinder on the, uh, the tissues inside there to be in saline rather than water. So saline is probably a better option can be used to treat respiratory disease in any species by placing the patient in a room with a fogging machine which delivers the F10 fog. Yes, that can be done. That certainly is an option. But as we discuss in the other answers, if we get a small particle size so it goes right the way down into the respiratory system, that is better. So A is okay, but it's not ideal. Option B, if F10 is applied by fogging or nebulization, the area should be well ventilated for 30 minutes before staff re-enter the room in case they have an adverse reaction. That That is not relevant. I mean, okay, if someone is a particularly bad asthmatic, it could trigger an issue. But in general terms, um, F10 uh, has been tested for both human and patient uh, safety, uh, acute safety in terms of uh, respiratory um, inhalation, and it's not an issue. So, so no one answering B is good. Answer C, uh, F10 SC1 and 250 in saline should be applied by nebulization. Nebulization generally is the right answer because nebulization can achieve a smaller particle size. And that is correct there, 0.5 to 2 mu, that's the right size that we're aiming for. So the particles carried as far as possible into the respiratory system. And again, three times a day for 30 minutes is, is great. So C is a good answer. D, F10SC 1 and 215 saline should be applied by nebulization, generating a particle size 2 to 5. Now, nebulization should always achieve 0.5 to 2, whereas fogging achieves 2 to 5. So D is, is not quite right in that respect. And then E, F10SC 1 and 250 in water, well, all of that is right, except we've got water there. And water's okay. Uh, you know, it is licensed to be used in water. I'm just saying that actually in saline is probably slightly kinder when you're specifically aiming to have it breathed into deep into the respiratory system. So I would say that C is the best answer and, uh, and uh, well done everyone for answering that. So thank you. Right, so back to Karen now. Um, just uh, before we carry on, um, Neil, I just see the questions there. Um, the one is the F10 with insecticide, can the patient with liquid and still be okay? In my opinion, yes, because I've seen that. Yeah. And, sim and there's another one that says, similar to Flores's question, are, are the F10 products with insecticide safe for ox pickers if they start picking in a treated wound of a large mammal? Um, yes, it is. Yes, um, yes. Absolutely, yeah. No, both of those are absolutely correct, and, and, and yes is the answer to both of those. Thank, thank you for fielding those questions. That's great. 
Yeah, I, I use them in birds all the time. Um, yep. And and um, I've had owls um, groom themselves with that pink insecticide ointment sure. and um, sure. on a common, Not a very common. Absolutely. Okay, yep. then things that you guys might see in your um, in your practice, actually. Just hang on for me one sec. Sorry, my dog's chasing my red heart of yes. <laughs> okay, so dussies and burn wounds. Um, because of urbanization, uh, these guys have less and less place to live. Um, and then they end up in people's engines because it's nice and warm. And um, then they burn themselves. Uh, we, we often see this. Oh, hang on one sec. I guess I'll just show you the picture before you carry on. Um, if you look at the pictures, they, it's, it's quite nasty. And oftentimes in the beginning, you don't see it. Um, and then a few days later, that whole thing sloughs off and becomes quite disgusting. Um, it's quite a common injury. Um, and their feet, they have very soft foot pads. Um, they have, don't have any nails. They only have one nail on the back foot for grooming. So, And their, feet, their foot pads are quite important for them because that's how they climb. They're excellent climbers. Um, I think they can climb a freaking vertical wall if they want to. Um, so most of these injuries are on the feet and legs. And we do use F10 SC for cleaning and the germicidal barrier ointment. Oftentimes with bandage, it's the same as the hedgehogs. They are nasty, dirty creatures if they don't have their own little rocky outcrop to poo in because they normally have a midden. But if you have them in a con um, confined environment, they do get quite um, dirty and they pee everywhere and then make their um, bandages dirty. Um, and then later on, the wound spray with insecticide again, flies are nasty and they it's a big problem especially in summer most of our carriers if we do have an issue we put a mosquito nets over them because of the flies but if you can keep them away um with this it's it's just um so much better because we don't have to worry about it because it can literally happen within a few hours you have a wound and it looks fantastic even with a bandage i've had flies lie eggs and hatch the maggots underneath a bandage um so it's quite important to keep them away so this little one was uh, admitted on the 24th of april in 2020 and released on the 12th of may so if you can look here again obviously i didn't mention all the other things that um, this little thing is on um, obviously pain meds is a big thing and antibiotics if it's if it's infected um, and then you can see sort of the sequence of events and then the last picture was on just the day or so before it was released you know that's perfectly granulated it's already have have epithelials over it um, and it, it, it works really well. And this one then could be released. That's a great case and a re really impressive response. Well done. Yeah, it's actually, they amaze you. Um, um, and also, again, no stitching required. Um, second intention all the time, because again, you don't want to cause striction, uh, strictures or anything like that. Uh, and then Kalcha can also make, talk about this one a little bit. This is an African civet. Uh, we got just the picture in the middle is not the one in question here. I just wanted to show people what the civet looks like if they didn't. Um, this animal came from us uh, to us on the 4th of November 2020. Uh, she was emaciated uh, and really, really ill. We suspect that she might have been caught or kept um, illegally in a, like a little zoo, one of these private disgusting little things and escaped because we think that something bit her like a dog. Um, they so this was what we got this is actually a few days after we got the the wound um it is enormous and really really quite disgusting with lots of stuff we actually cultured this wound um the stuff that came out so we could have it on and again this is not an animal that you can just take out and bandage every day this one we also put a stained bandage on again you have to keep it moist so um f10 uh, to clean it uh, we, we used copious amounts of f10 ointment uh we do actually use other oint, uh, other um wound products as well because we we sometimes have to uh we sometimes get one of these things from a human um um uh, 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 this is actually the, um one of the vets that do this is molnica products it's you spray it on and it has uh, pig hemoglobin in it which um, improves vascularization which i think is fantastic um, and then the problem with this one again it's flies because she's outside in an enclosure we didn't keep her inside um so again the pink the spray i use a lot of it um, and these ones the wound started uh curling in on the edges as you can see and again you can't stitch this, this is way too big but uh, she was released and this is sort of the sequence of of what the wound looks like on the left is lovely granulated tissue um 
by this time we wouldn't even use the um the um, insecticide it, um, spray anymore because it shouldn't be attractive to flies and you can see the wind edge is closing and on the right is when she was released and Katja actually did the release and the final check and that was the size of the wound at the end and that's those are Katja's fingers in the in the photo just goes to show you how wonderful nature is if, if you can just stop the infection and the fly problems and so on um, nature and the body can do a tremendous tremendously good job but uh, obviously we need that F10 germicidal ointment with insecticide to uh, solve the first two problems lovely case there thank you um, yeah just to say she also gained a whole lot of weight and she was released successfully and she is doing really well apparently um, and then burn wounds. I think you guys also see quite a few of these. The reason why I'm talking about tortoises is because they are one of the most common ones we see. Um, and most people see them long after the event, sadly, uh, because they are slow movers. Um, for me, the most important here, apart from pain meds, is fluid and fluids and keeping their wounds moist. And oftentimes people forget this because it's a tortoise uh, and they don't look as ill as they are. The scoots are extremely sensitive. It's like having your nails pulled off if you pull off a scoot. The, the, the nerve endings in them is insane. So, and if you don't keep that moist, um, you'll see this picture here, that scoot that's missing, that's completely dead bone underneath there. And once that happens, you sort of lost this and you have to euthanize them. And this particular animal was euthanized because um, not only do they burn with the fire coming across them, afterwards they actually walk away and then walk through the coals. And this one had burnt and the, all her limbs had become necrotic. So she is not releasable or she cannot actually continue. So this one, for burn wounds, um, we do IV or subcut fluids and you keep the scoots moist. Um, if they dry out, they will die. So the one on the top, you can see what we sort of fashioned this little thing. So what we did is we smeared F10 on it, like thick, looks like a glazed ham. And then we put um, even moist uh, saline um, soaked swabs. And then we use that tube, sock tube thing that you use for wounds and actually put that over so that it stays in place. And you can also see the F10 um, we don't use the insecticide on them, just the normal F10 barrier ointment. You can see on the legs as well. It's just, we smear it almost, you just keep smearing it. Um, and this, this particular tortoise um, was also used in those, unfortunately, because the wounds on the legs were just horrible. Um, and we changed this every second day just to keep it moist. And then later on, if you look here, um, this particular tortoise, she survived. She's still with us. Uh, she has a feeding tube because you didn't want to eat but you can see the um the bandage is actually just to keep the feeding tube in place and you can see the uh, the f10 it's just basically when you walk past and close a uh, little cage if there's a spot that hasn't doesn't have it on you smear it on there and and that works really well because it has an oil base if i'm correct neil and yeah. um and that yeah. keeps on it for quite a long time yeah just to, just to clarify the the uh, oil carrier is lanolin that sheep oil so you know it's, it's not a petroleum compound this is a completely natural animal derived product and and of course no animals have suffered to produce it um so it's, it's sheep lanolin and, and a lovely natural product now so she's actually with us unfortunately well this will take months to years to actually heal but um, she's doing well, gaining weight. She pulled out a feeding tube and is eating normally now. Good. <laughs> so fly strike, like I've mentioned a million times. You know, it's easy with your dog and your cat at home. You can see it. It stays inside. You put Advantix on and there you go. Uh, for me, it's an issue. So this picture, you can see those yellow things are all fly eggs. So this one had a dog bite wound and the flies just lay their eggs there. And then a day later, it's maggot. It's just disgusting. I don't really like maggots. Um, so again, the germicidal barrier ointment with insecticide or the wound spray with insecticide. For me, it's, well, you know this, it's, it's safe for all species, but in cats. So we don't use it in cats. I haven't used it in wild feelers, um, but I think you reference Dr. Michelle Barrows in the previous webinar that she used it in large feelers. Yeah. Okay. And and just just to raise this issue here with with fly strike here that, and even an animal as big as a sheep 
can be dead within 24 hours of fly strike starting. And this is all to do with the toxins which are produced by the maggots and, and uh, uh, it squirts it released into the surrounding tissue. So the whole point with fly strike is prevention, prevention, prevention. Okay, if you get one in that's, that's affected, by all means use uh, one of these insecticidal F10 products. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to do justice to the animal, we want to prevent it happening, um, you know, as, as long as it's not already there when it comes in, um, is, is a far better solution. Oh, just a point, just to make, um, to, if people use it, F10 insecticide um, spray does burn, because we use it on our own wounds in the hospital, um, just so you know, it can sting quite a bit. So if it's um, something that has a large wound and you need to irrigate it and make sure or you you putting it on a wound just uh, we normally would sedate them for that but if it's something that you spray around it's absolutely fine and and just to clarify the dose rate of this that it is it is one pump per kilogram body weight so um you know if, if you've got a hedgehog like this it, it's not a question of soaking the whole back end of the, of the of the hedgehog it's just one one little spray over that bit and you don't have to pull the maggots out the maggots will come out of their own accord so yeah. do you know as ever always read the manufacturer's instructions and apply it in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions and also, I, um, I we never use ivermectin. I know people use ivermectin for flies, strike, or maggots. I don't use it at all. I don't think it's it's um, safe. So we just use a topical product, and it works mm. really well. Okay, so we have another polling question here. Um, so Karen, before you go to the poll, mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, Karen, before you go to the poll, there's a question on hedgehog treatments come up by Elfridi asking if she can use the same drugs that you suggested for dassies for chemical burn wounds in hedgehogs uh yes you can yes you can all the same um obviously their their pain meds and and um antibiotics would be a bit different uh their doses are different than to dassies they have huge antibiotic doses um and you normally use only metacam for three days but you can use exactly the same the problem is here the bandaging um, you can't really bandage their legs. We, we do sometimes, but if they can't curl up, they get quite stressed. Um, but you can use the same product, yes. And le let me just chuck in one thing about hedgehogs there. Nothing to do with F10, but certainly uh, in, in our practice, when we've treated hedgehogs, we've had some with really severe stomatitis. Some of them can get a, a herpes virus, gingivitis, and, and have really, really sore mouths. So if you've got a problem with a, an, an underweight hedgehog coming in or that just doesn't want to eat because it's in so much pain, there's actually nothing to stop you putting a pharyngostomy tube in these guys. Um, and uh, so, you know, you anesthetize them and uh, put the tube in and normal normal way you would uh, part of the way down the neck and then attach the tube to the tops of the spines on the back so that way you can actually maintain oral medication fluids and feeding until the little hedgehog feels an awful lot better so you know although as, as Karen says they're challenging patients to to a allow you to do what you need to do for them but you think about it there's usually a way around it yes we actually um, had a hedgehog with a broken tibia recently and actually we wanted to put in an x fix because the bandage wouldn't work but thankfully it had healed by itself there was already a callus but the reason we put the it would have put an x fix in because we have small enough pins is that could it it could actually then bend its leg because sure. often we obviously don't want that 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 leg to fuse or that wound uh yeah. that um yeah. joint because they have to roll up yeah. Straight up creatures. Great. Okay, so on to the next polling question. Um, which one statement is most accurate in respect to the use of F10 barrier ointment in the prevention and treatment of infection associated with tra traumatic wounds in wildlife patients? So A, germicidal ointment uses lanolin as the base. This causes an excessive delay in tissue healing and is contraindicated in open wounds. Or B, Germicidal ointment has a short-lived effect and needs to be reapplied daily. Or C, germicidal ointment is only effective against fungi and gram-negative bacteria and envelope viruses and hence has limited efficacy in infected wounds. Or D, germicidal ointment may be placed in draining, deeper or superficial wounds and achieves an effective infection control action for several days after a single application. Or E, 
germicidal ointment is effect, highly effective against gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, but when these are removed, it is not uncommon to suffer a fungal overgrowth in the wound. So if you guys can pull away there, that would be good. Okay, so looking at that, and I've, I've now managed to get the results. So we've got um, a good number of people replied. We've got 80 odd percent saying D, 17 percent saying B, and 3 percent C, and so on down. So we'll just run through them. So A, germicide ointment uses lanolin as the base and it causes excessive delay in tissue healing. No, it doesn't. It really isn't a problem. The benefit achieved by controlling infection and keep, and most importantly, keeping the wound moist far outweighs any academic suggestion that there is a delay in healing. So we forget about that one. Germicide ointment has a short-lived effect and needs to be replayed daily. We know that's wrong. Um, we've, we've already said a single application typically will uh, look after the wound for a two, if not three-day period. C, germicide ointment is only effective against fungi, gram-negative bacteria, and envelope viruses. That's incorrect. Um, you should all know the efficacy data now that uh, F10 is effective against um, gram-positives, gram-negatives, fungi, and viruses, both enveloped and non-enveloped viruses. D, germicide ointment may be placed in a draining, deeper, or superficial wound and achieves an effective infection control action for several days after a single application. That's absolutely right. And that's, you know, although looking at these cases, the Karen has used a lot of F10 on superficial wounds, but it can be used in deeper wounds if they're draining and does last for a number of days. And then E, germicide alignment is highly effective against gram positive and negative bacteria. But when you remove those, you can get a fungal infection. Well, of course, the answer is that F10 is very, very effective against fungi as well. So, no, no, e is absolute rubbish. So yes, everyone did, uh, the vast majority of people did well. 77% uh, chose D, which was correct, and 17% uh, saying it has to be applied every day. Well, in most cases, that's, that's not necessary to be applied every day. So Karen, back to you. Okay, another one of fly strike. Let me just see where, what I've done here. Um, is owls or raptors that we get in with trichomoniasis so what you see if you look on the picture on the right you can just see that plaque inside the mouth now the plaque that the trichomonas parasite um, ha causes is is, a, is dead tissue so and if you smell that animal's or that bird's mouth it smells like um, putrefaction and that is wonderful for flies so what happens is if you look on the left it's very difficult to see but there's maggots tiny maggots crawling out of the the nasal cavity of this owl on the left Poor and thing. actually in the in the eyes as well around the eyes so it it is quite horrible for them so when we get them in obviously we stabilize them and they are on fluids and 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 antibiotics but we try then we flush their sinuses with normal f10 if they once they're stable of course otherwise they'll just die and we i what i then do is you take an earbud with the F10 um, insecticidal spray on and sort of dab it around the eyes and the face. And that keeps them from coming back because that it will the, that plaque stays in for quite a long time. We don't even mm. always keep them until it falls out, but it is a, a wonderful attraction for flies and it can actually lead to their death very quickly if you don't, because um, you can imagine not being able to get to flies that crawl out in your sinus and your eyes. Um, it must be excruciating for them. Sure. So that's just, just a little point here, something we'll discuss in, in a bit more detail, detail later on, but we've just got some really exciting uh, new test data for F10, and this was in relation to the efficacy of F10 against Giardia. Giardia obviously is, uh, you know, a common protozoal parasite, um, and, and so we know that F10 can kill protozoa. We also know because of the safety testing that uh, animals can, uh, you can apply F10SC 1 and 250 into an animal's mouth and it doesn't cause any toxic problems. So in, in fact, uh, with these trichomonas cases, you can 
actually spray uh, F10SC 1 in 250 directly into the bird's mouth um, because it will have a beneficial effect against the trichomonas, but as you rightly say, it also helps control that uh, necrotic tissue and, and, and secondary mm. infections in, in the wound as well. It works really well. And then in one of my favorite things is pangolins. Uh, <laughs> many of them present with wounds. Um, this one in particular, his name was Tom. He had a snare around him, and you can see just about where he's um, around his torso. And we have used the F10 SC diluted, 1 in 250, to clean the wounds. And we do sometimes use a gymnocidal barrier ointment, not with the insecticide. The reason for this is they are supposed to be related to felids. 84 million years ago and i am too scared to try an f10 on them because i don't want to accidentally cause the death of one i, um, I think just just to correct that it's not that you're too scared it's that they're too precious to take yes. any risk at all um yes. that you know we, in, in, we, we hope the that they've range. forgotten that they they were related to cats <laughs> but they're too precious to take that risk strangely enough we have tried panado in them paracetamol and it works mm -hmm. and it doesn't kill them so yeah. sometimes they want to be cats and sometimes they want to be dogs. Right. So, right. Um, yeah, this wound needed a whole lot more treatment um, because it was all the way down to the bone mm. to the, and I'm thankfully not all the way into the thoracic cavity, but he took about eight weeks to heal mm. and he has been free for months now um, because he's monitored with a satellite tag and a VHF tag. And he's absolutely happy where he is now. Fantastic, fantastic. So yeah, you can see more wounds. The one on the left is normally what we get when they try and scratch themselves out of things that they've been kept in. So people will keep them in a cage or a chicken coop and they climb out and they try and scratch. The, the front feet are quite powerful. And then this one as well, um, the one in the middle is also a wound of trying to get out. Um, and this one was hurt quite badly. Um, these are quite superficial wounds, but because they're so super immune compromised, uh, they actually get really bad infections if you don't treat them. So, um, and obviously, well, these guys don't eat in captivity, so they go out foraging every day for four to six hours. We have pangolin walkers that do this, each and every one. So again, it has to be something that an animal can walk with on dirt and still be okay. Um, so it's, it's something we use quite a lot. And then this one. Uh, this is one a really awesome case for me. I absolutely love Southern African pythons. Um, she was found on a reserve, this little lady. Yeah, she had a very large ulcerated mass near the tip of her tail. And you know, she she had been she got she'd gone into somebody's French drain and just sat there. Um, so she was really quite ill, dehydrated, underweight. And I used F10 to clean it. I know you shouldn't really use insecticide on snakes on an open wound but i actually did use it in her because that wound was so ulcerated and so bad um and it's almost impossible for them you know they obviously don't lick their wounds so you can't the, the flies would just be a, a horrible thing so we did surgery on the 23rd of august this year and on the 26th of September, we removed it, uh, the sutures, and we actually sent it away for culture. We did a CT in her, actually, um, right in the beginning to see if, if it's something that could have spread. Uh, thankfully, there was no metastasis, and it seemed to have been only on the tip of her tail. And it came back. You can see here, that's what it looked like. It's horrible. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. a huge thing. Um, there she is in the middle of being ventilated during her surgery, and that's the wound at the end when we removed the tip of the tail um and that healed really well and she was released actually two days ago and she's now back into the wild where she came from fantastic oh, wow. it's, it's interesting certainly some work i've done on neoplasia in in birds um shows that fibrosarcomas you know you would think it's a sarcoma it would spread but actually certainly in birds fibrosarcomas are only locally malignant they don't metastasize um and and obviously thinking that birds and reptiles are pretty closely uh, aligned um it's um you know it, it's good to hope and having done your yeah. CT, being responsible, you've done the CT to check for any potential metastasis. Um, but uh, hopefully it, it will uh, behave just as it does in birds, which would be fantastic. 
Yes, I did obviously have to do some research on this. So, you know, read some articles on it, and apparently it's more common than, than people think. But the reason why it's not really picked up is because people don't really take their snakes into the vet. Sure. Uh, and they yeah. don't do um, lots of things on it. So luckily we are able to do that. Um, and also just to this, she was so uncomfortable with this um, about – a few days after the surgery, because normally pythons, Southern African pythons, are quite aggressive snakes. And she was very calm in the beginning, but once that thing was off, she became mm. a python again. So <laughs> it had quite an effect on her. And just to tell people, pythons often lose the tips of their tails. Um, it's common because things bite them on it and, and they lose tips of it. So the tip of the tail being lost is actually not an issue sure. for her. Sure. Um, it did, obviously didn't include the cloaca. And there you go. I think that's that's... There she is. There's a CT scan we did. Um, pretty lady. And then the one on the right is once the day that I removed the sutures. It, it takes a bit longer than in mammals because they take long to get sick and they take sure. long, take sure. long sure. to sure. heal. But um, yeah, it was really nice. I think it's the first time that a python's been CT scanned in at Equic Care because mm -hmm. <laughs> that's where mm -hmm. we take our animals for CT scans. Fantastic. And, so they were quite excited as well. Brilliant. Okay, so we're going to pass over to Katya now. Um, Katya, obviously, you know, is based at uh, Honest Support. Uh, so, Katya, over to you and to your clinical cases to share with us. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentations you've seen so far from Karen. Um, I'm going to show a couple of cases I've done. Um, so, the cases I deal with are slightly different from the cases that Karen deals with. Um, that I see a lot of zoo animals, um, I see a lot of reserve animals that do have an owner. Um, um, so I don't tend to see the sort of street cases as much as she does. Um, so these is caracals, kittens, and some black-footed cats, and these are microsporum. And we get them very, very frequently in these cats, especially at the time of weaning, they get really stressed and they get um get these lesions usually they're typically the ringworm lesions the round lesions um sometimes it's just a crusting and scaling on 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 the nose and around the eyes and and usually we can get the fungus off it so obviously for us important is to prevent spread to keep us to other animals um as well as in the environment so we usually put the f10 ointment on without the insecticide because they're small feelets so I don't feel like killing one of those either um, and we, if it's really bad we actually bath the entire cat in F10 shampoo so we lather it we bath it in F10 shampoo and usually that's sufficient and we don't actually have to do any systemic treatment um, and it clears up within a couple of weeks mm. so so I find it's very very effective um, I've put it on the keepers as well, but I don't think we need to advertise that. <laughs> so, Katja, tell me, when you shampoo these these cats, how long do you leave the shampoo on for? Hmm, I think that depends on the individual cat and okay. how, uh, um, huh. uh, how it, it tolerates it. <laughs> sure, so some sure. of them are really, really tolerable, yeah. and they will allow it, and some of them are quite wild. So if it's, yeah. if it's kittens that um, a parent reared, um, handling them is really difficult. So sure. If I get five minutes, I would be very happy. Okay, okay. I prefer 10. I try for 10, but yeah, yeah. sometimes 10 yeah. minutes is yeah. just not going to happen. Yeah. But, that, you know, actually, you know, what, what you're telling us there is to get a response with a once weekly shampoo uh, after just a couple of weeks. And, and you know, we, we would. I would normally be aiming for 15 minutes if I could, and even if I had to sedate the animal, I would. But actually, it shows you the efficacy of the F10. If you can achieve that in just a couple of weeks uh, with often only five minutes, that, that really speaks volumes. Great, yeah, thanks. No, so I'm very happy, and I said, even if they get it on for a short period of time, I think it does yeah. a lot better. And Great. I think if you shampoo it, we don't get the contamination in the environment. So even yeah, if I yeah. can just, just yeah. one, one bathing in and get once the whole animal and then I treat the individual round yeah. lesions, yeah. it yeah. tends to clear up really, really well. Good. Um, so I, I would always say if you can bath it once and if you have to also date it for the first bath, okay. usually we can get away with it. Sure. Usually I sure. can get one bath for five minutes in with, without yeah, yeah. either yeah. a keeper being... Um, attacked or anything else like that. And do, you, do you then get the keepers to sanitize the environment with F10 as well? 
Yes, so we yeah. spray down the entire enclosure. We remove yeah. any wooden structure okay. that we yeah. can. Yeah. Um, and, and then we spray the, everything down with the F10, yeah. leave it. Um, and then it, yeah. if we can, ideally, we don't put any animals in for 24 hours, just letting sure. it dry sure. and then put them back in. Yeah. But I think that's so important, isn't it? And, and you know, from time to time, we hear about cases where people say, oh, it didn't work. Well, you know, if it didn't work, it's because you haven't done the whole process. And, you know, what we discussed there, not only, as you say, a, a shampoo of all of them to start off with to minimize contamination and treating the environment that they're in at the same time really thoroughly, it, it just... It's like putting a blanket over the whole thing. It, it just dampens it down completely straight away. And then that's where you get your effective treatment. So that that's good. <laughs> Sorry, my son is complaining in the background. So oh, dear. Oh dear. He, needs, he needs some F10 too, probably. <laughs> <laughs> okay, carry on. So, so the next case I wanted to present was really, really nice. Um, it's not wildlife per se because it's a fossa and for those of you who want have seen a fossa so fossa um is a carnivore of madagascar it hunts lemurs it's a very aggressive very agile creature with a really long tail so they can jump from tree to tree and um oops i don't know why i'm jumping and tree to tree and actually catch the lemurs so it's it's a really, really interesting one. And it's the first one we had in the hospital. So unfortunately, if you look at the x-ray on the right hand side of the slide, you can see it's actually missing some toes. Um, so it came in because it's made bitted and it lost several toes and then it got a secondary infection in there and had an open wound that we needed to treat with. So we cleaned that wound with F10. I stitched it as much as I could just to try and get uh, closed and removed the one necrotic area on that one toe that you can see up here. So we removed that last bit of toe and took all that necrotic out and um, put some F10 on the bandage and bandaged it. I only got in 24 hours of bandaging <laughs> Then the fossa decided to eat my bandage. <laughs> Bless her. But if you look at the picture in the middle, this is actually the back toe, a foot that um, has healed incredibly well. Um, obviously, we put it on pain, in, on pain medication and antibiotics as well. But, you know, within three days, she was excellent. And within a day, she was actually weight-bearing on that foot mm. and, and doing really good. Um, mm. Just as a note, fossils are very destructive. That wooden pallet does no longer exist. Okay. <laughs> she decided that that was also to be eaten. Right. But it was a very interesting case for me because it was a case I don't, a species I normally don't work with, and mm. she responded really, really well to the bandaging and the treatment. Um, and she's back with its mate. Hopefully, they're not killing each other. So unfortunately, fossils fight when you put them together, so they only tolerate each other for the mating time. So you sure. have to get your timing incredibly right when you put them together. Otherwise, you have severe injuries happening. Mm. So um, Maui is my next case. Maui is a black-footed cat. It's part of the conservation project from Mapumalanga Park Sports. So we have black-footed cats that are being released um, in, back into the wild. And some of them are part of the breeding program. So they are not on display. They're not visible in the zoo. They're kept because these are really shy creatures, don't like to be handled, don't like to be messed with. They are off display. Um, where there is no kids and no people. And Maui is hand reared, but he only tolerates certain amount of handling. And then he gets quite stressed. Unfortunately, he um, presented with an increased respiratory rate. He came in with an respiratory rate of 45, completely flat, um, had severe pneumonia. So we were actually nebulizing three times a day with F10. Um, in the in saline, as, as discussed, and then he was in oxygen cham chamber as well for about two weeks because we just couldn't get his oxygen um, saturation up sufficiently. But he made a full recovery, which we mm. were really, really excited mm. about because he his lungs were pretty much, you know, um, solidified by the time we actually started to work with him because we didn't realize how bad it was till he actually went really downhill. Yeah. 
It's a, it's a great case. Of, I'm sorry, the polling question about uh, uh, treating respiratory infection should actually have come at this point. It doesn't really matter. But uh, as you say, I mean, with him, he was very, very severe. And as we discussed previously in the exotic small mammal uh, webinars, remember with smaller mammals where there is no division in the lung field, left and right. I mean, there's a there's division between left and right, but the right side, there is no division between cranial, middle and caudal parts of the lung and so on. So when these respiratory infections happen, they affect the whole of one side and they're much, much more serious than they would be in, say, a cow or a sheep or, or a rhinoceros even. Um, and that's why it's so important when you're treating these cases to treat them really thoroughly. So from my point of view, yes, okay, systemic antibiotics, pain relief, um, F10 by nebulization, uh, if there are species that, that eats hay or beds on hay, then actually soaking that for a proper 12-hour period before they have it. So increasing the, improving the air quality, uh, reducing stress and everything, but giving them absolutely 110% treatment, including nebulization with F10, right from day one. Because if you don't get them right straight away, you'll find that these cases come back again and again, and, and very often, sadly, the patient doesn't make a, a full and proper recovery. So uh, I think really important, and, and thank you for sharing that one. Yeah, so that's just him a um, couple of days later. So he was very excited, and he was eating the mice that we provided him. So within two days of treatment, he was actually starting to take food um, and we could, you know, medicate him um, orally, which meant less handling, less stress for him. So then, and he would, because he was in the oxygen box, tank, it was much easier to nebulize him as well. So we didn't even move him out of the tank, we just nebulized was in the tank. And yeah, so there, for those of you who wanted it, um, we started with three times and then dropped it twice. And we used some pulmic cord as well um, because we just needed to get those airways up and we put it in with the F10 for nebulizing. So pulmic cord is a cortisone. Um, it's used a lot in pediatric medicine. Um, so we chose that because we knew that there was severe inflammation in the lungs and we have treated some black-footed cats with oral prednisolone and they unfortunately sort of had a severe pancreatic reaction to the cortisone and to the stress associated with the increased cortisone and they died on me so now i don't use any systemic cortisone in black for the cats um, i only use it as as a topical treatment or nebulizing mm -hmm. um, oh, you've got okay. a polling question so next next polling question which statement is most accurate in respect of F10 with insecticide products. So FA, F10's germicidal spray with insecticide is safe for use on all mammals and should be applied liberally to the coat once a week. B, F10 germicidal spray with insecticide, as with all medications, must be used in care with care in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. It should not be used in cats. The application rate is one pump per kilogram body weight once a week. Or C, F10 germicidal spray with insecticide, as with all medications, must be used in care with care in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. It should not be used in cats. Germicidal barrier ointment should not be used in ungulates due to the sensitization to the lanolin carrier. D, F10 germicidal spray with insecticide is, is designed for use on solid surfaces and should never be applied to a patient's skin. Or E, the spray should be applied to the skin one pump per kilogram body weight every three days or as often as the coat gets wet. So if you guys would like to pull away. I think everyone's getting the hang of this. And uh, obviously, we've been discussing a lot of these things uh, along the way. So, um, yeah, 92% or 89%. Um, so, just to run through them then. So, A, germicidal spray with insecticide is safe for use on all mammals and should be applied liberally to the coat once a week. Well, as we said before, cats, it, it can only be used with great care. So, um, that, that is wrong. B, 
Germicidal spray with insecticides, as with all medications, must be used in a court in, with care in accordance with the manufacturer recommendations. Obviously, that's correct. It should not be used in cats. That is correct, uh, or, or you know, in exceptional circumstances with great care. Uh, the application rate is one pump per kilogram body weight once a week. That is correct. Um, C. Uh, F10 germicidal spray with insecticides, uh, as with all medications, must be used with care in accordance with the manufacturer's recommendations. It should not be used in cats. Germicidal barrier ointment should not be used in ungulates due to sensitization to the lanolin carrier. That's completely incorrect. Lanolin, as we said before, comes from sheep. It does not cause a problem to ungulates at all. So that's incorrect. D, F10 germicidal spray with insecticide is designed for use on solid surfaces and should never be applied to the patient's skin. There is an F10 uh, insecticidal spray for solid surfaces, but that's a totally different product. So when we're talking about the F10 germicidal spray with insecticide, it is used for the patient's skin. So that is uh, an incorrect answer there as well. And then E, the spray should be applied to the skin one pump per kilogram body weight every three days or as often as the coat gets wet. Well, we know it's once a week. So uh, so there we are. So yes, B, 81%. Well done, everybody. Good for you on that one. So we'll, we'll push on and back to catcher. All right, so the next one was a giraffe. Uh, actually, there were seven of them. They were youngsters that were transported. And when they did the transport, we assume we don't know it because we weren't involved in the transport, the blindfolds were not sitting correctly. Uh, and they were putting pressure on the eyes. Yeah. So they're presented with these corneal ulcers, and you can see them on the left, and that were severe, that were uh, very, very painful. and you know, also then resulted in a lot of fly activity around sure. sort of tearing eyes. So we had massive amount of flies around them and these giraffes didn't do well. So what we did, unfortunately, the one eye was not savable and that giraffe unfortunately didn't make it. But for the others, we put um, third eyelid flaps around. Mm -hmm. so we basically just closed the eyelids and then put F10 ointment in the pink one. So we to try and reduce the fly activities because we couldn't, you know, really do much else to prevent it and we couldn't handle them. These guys sure. were wild. We got kicked. We got so we had we knocked them out to obviously do it. And then we knocked them out three days later just to have a look at it. But hmm. without any sedation, these guys were not handleable. Yeah. Yeah. But just whilst we're talking, said, my, my animals are quite dangerous. These yeah, are yeah. quite hard. Yeah. Just whilst we're on that case and we're thinking about eyes, um, those of you who weren't uh, able to join us for the uh, tr F10 treatment of avian patients will have missed the fact that uh, I described cases that I've had of um, candida conjunctivitis, so a fungal conjunctivitis in, in a couple of birds that I've treated, um, and, and actually acquiring an antifungal topical ophthalmic preparation is damn nigh impossible and extremely expensive. So in that situation, I used F10 SC. Just being cautious, I, I mixed it one in 500, um, and I applied a couple of drops to each eye twice a day. And within 48 hours, the, the eyes were completely normal. But you know, one wouldn't normally think about putting a disinfectant product, and this is the whole point. F10 is a treatment product as well as a disinfectant. And uh, we, you know, I, I used it because I knew from the safety tests that uh, there was no corneal inflammation when you put uh, diluted F10 into the eye. But I knew also it was effective against uh, fungus, uh, so uh, it, it worked really well. And uh, okay, you were going to get kicked, so you couldn't do that. But uh, uh, it, it's just worth sharing with people. But nice case, thank you. Um, and then th this is obviously one of the cases that wasn't typically my case. It was um, from a colleague of mine. Um, uh, it was uh, Professor Stierenkamp. So he's treated a lot of rhinos which have been injured during poaching. So unfortunately, we see a lot of poaching in rhinos. And for those who have survived, um, usually the hack off the horn, leaving the nasal sinuses incredibly um, exposed, often already with fly strike by the time we find them. And as Karen was mentioning earlier with the scoots, this was incredibly painful. You know, these animals are in severe distress and you need to sort of close this very sensitive area up. So what usually gets done is we actually use the F10 with um, um, the pink ointment with um, insecticide, we lather it with it, and then we apply a dressing over it. And mm. for, for this rhino, 
um, it's, it's sort of more plastered on. Later on, we've actually screwed them on. So we put the dressings on and we screwed them into the side where the horn sort of positions to keep them in place. Because as it heals, unfortunately, rhinos have this really horrible, nasty habit of trying to rub it off. Hmm. And they will then try and use that stump and rub it off. Um, so, so you need to have a dressing that's actually sort of made with screws and steel and put on. And, and we've done sort of mesh wiring and so on to try and keep it in place. And this is done usually once a week. So as we said before, it's, it's you know, it's, it's treated once a week, sometimes even only every 10 days, because you need to keep the, the amount of immobilizations to a minimum and uh, you cannot handle these animals on a daily basis. So, but yeah, this this one was went really, really well and she is released back into a reserve um, and she's had her first calf. Oh, brilliant. And I think, you know, whilst we've got up there, I, I think it's it's only right and proper to say that, of course, F10 have been fantastic supporters of the treatment of uh, poached rhinos. And I think everyone involved with them would would uh, agree with me in saying that actually the use of F10 germicidal ointment with insecticide is, you know, as well as all the treatment and the screwed on dressing and everything, obviously, but it, it does make a major, major difference to the survival survival of these poor um, uh, creatures which have been so so badly mutilated. So uh, thanks to, to uh, Health and Hygiene for their support. Okay, so on, oops, on we go. Uh, on we go, and we, we're going to talk about... <laughs> I'll leave it to computers. you, Katya. <laughs> yeah, no, it's moving on its own accord now. Um, but yeah, so the next thing I'm going to talk about is a bit less of flamingos. So I, I unfortunately, or not, un, un, sadly, I had to deal with um, flamingos that were rescued off Kim, in Kimberley off the dam. And the member of the public went out when there was a huge drought and these um, chicks were all dying in shell or on, in the nest on, on the side because the adults were having to retreat because of the water issue. And we ended up with about 3,000 day old flamingo chicks in Hauteng which was overwhelming for all the rehab centers involved and who's involved and it was a massive undertaking. We've had keepers and veterinarians fly in from all over the world to help us treat because unfortunately we just didn't have enough expertise and enough hands on site to deal with them. Um, when they initially came, they came in cardboard boxes. There were 26 cardboard boxes with about 20 flamingos each. And, you know, we started with cardboard box once, one and triaged them. And by the time we got to cardboard box 20, it was time for cardboard box one. So it was just a non, non, never ending story. And it was incredibly time consuming because these guys had to be tube fed every two hours um, and, and needed fluids and needed treatment. But that's beyond it. Um, they all brought avian pox with them from the dam or they picked it up in Hauteng, but we assume they actually brought it with them from the dam. And due to the stress, they developed quite severe, severe lesions. Um, so they got them on their eyes, they got them on their feet. Um, they're basically all the featherless skin. Um, beaks were severely affected. And what we would do, we would treat these lesions with F10. Um, the ones on the eyes, we actually removed and then put F10 around the eyes. Um, because if you leave them, left them, they would get bigger and actually destroy the entire eyelids and then the animals couldn't close them and, um, and it would actually d damage the eyes. For the ones on the beaks, we did the same because they were so locally aggressive, we removed them surgically. Um, the ones on the legs itself, we left, we just treated with F10 on a daily basis and they actually just healed on their own accord. Um, the ones on the foot as well, we had to remove because they became so obstructive. And interesting one, this is called Beaky, as, as a very interesting name. Why did we name it Beaky? Because the entire beak fell off. So oh. it was be beautifully named Beaky. But the pox lesion destroyed basically its entire mandible. Hmm. Um, the whole pox lesion comes out and it comes out, comes out as a, like a plaque lesion. And then there's nothing left. So there was no beak left. So um, I took F10, shoved the hole, and sutured some granuflex bandage material over it. And I had to do that for 
I think about 12 weeks till we actually had resolution. But the beak healed nicely. There's some scarring. You can see it on the right. Um, Beaky did not make release criteria because of the injuries. So he's now living as an ambassador in, in the zoo environment. But, you know, at least he could feed. He, he can feed himself. He does really, really well. And, yeah, we, we actually managed to save him, which was not something we thought when he initially presented sure. with that lesion. Sure. Because these lesions would explode from small, small lesions in a day mm. or two to mm. three days later, the entire beak being gone. Yeah. So they were yeah. very, very um, destructive and very, yeah. very fast growing. Yeah. So just, just whilst we're talking about avipox, and obviously there's a whole range of uh, diseases in birds and, and other zoo species and wildlife species which are spread by biting insects. And obviously in this case, the, the flamingo chicks arrived already infected with pox. But if, if, if clinicians out there are, are working with any zoo species where um, fly vectors are a risk, then what we will do is uh, put uh, windbreak material, uh, netlon material around an aviary or around an enclosure and spray that with F10 insecticidal, uh, in F10 germicidal spray with insecticide. And just simply putting that on the this um, windbreak around the enclosure does significantly reduce the instance of uh, insect vector um, activity um uh, which which can be really really useful so um, you know that again is a, a, another application of f10 insects in germicidal spray with insecticide in relation to these patients but uh, yeah thanks to to you and everyone else who worked on those birds i think uh, I, at the time i was actually uh, teaching down at sankob so i caught up with a, a fair few of them down there um but it was a massive international effort and uh, thankfully an awful lot of whilst a lot of them did die a lot of them did survive and do very well so thanks for all your your efforts and everyone else on that and at this point i think if you can play the video that would be really awesome here we go it's a little bit noisy i pre warn everybody <laughs> put back out in Kimberley on the dam. So they all got little yellow rings on, so we know who they are. And yeah, um, that was their first attempts of flying. May I say they were not very graceful at that <laughs> But obviously a lot of wind. And, and you know, one has to you stop and think about these flamingos. You know, they will, they will live to 35, 40 plus years. So, you know, saving each one of those to then carry on breeding for a, a long period in the future is a, a major conservation uh, effort. So uh, I say congratulations. Okay, so we've got another polling question here, um, and the poll is, which statement is most correct in respect of the potential use of F10SC in the control and treatment of protozoal contamination and infections? So A, F10SC has no proven efficacy against protozoa. B, F10SC has recently attained an efficacy test certificate for F10SC 1 in 100 for 60 minutes uh, application against Giardia. Further tests are currently ongoing at lower contact times. Um, or C, F10SC is effective against protozoa using F10SC at 1 in 250 with a contact time of 5 minutes. Or D, whilst F10SC is effective against waterborne protozoa, in view of its lengthy residual status in water, it is not recommended for use in water treatment plants. Or E, F10SC is effective against protozoa in water, but not in dirty situations, nor has it been uh, any proven efficacy in the skin or in the gut of patients. So uh, if you can poll away and we'll see where we get to with those. Uh, 
Okay, so we'll just run through them. A, we obviously we know that's wrong because I told I let it slip earlier that uh, we do have a efficacy certificate against protozoa. So A is totally wrong. B, F10SC has recently attained an efficacy test certificate for F10SC at one in a hundred with 60 minutes contact time against Giardia, um, and that that's in in relation to contaminated water. So that is that is a correct answer. Uh, C, F10SC is effective against protozoa using F10SC at 1 in 250 with a contact time of 5 minutes. That is incorrect, or at least we don't know it's correct. It may yet be proven to be correct, but that's not something that we can put our name to at this point in time. D, whilst F10SC is effective against waterborne protozoa in view of its lengthy residual status in water. Well, that's not true. That, that is a wrong answer, okay? And then F10SC is effective against protozoa in water. Yes, that's correct, but not in dirty situations. Well, it probably isn't as good, but we don't know that at the moment, nor has it any proven efficacy on the skin or in the gut of, of, of patients. Well, we don't know. Uh, it, it may yet be proven that we can use it, for example, for the control of Macrorhabdus ornithogaster uh, in, in budrigars or giardia on the skin of cockatiels and so on. So this is a, a really exciting new avenue of research for us to see where we can use it and where it's going to be effective. But for sure, B is correct, but it is it is quite possible that, that E may be good and, and C may be good as well, but watch this space. Um, so anyway, on on we go. So just before I finish, I, I want to say a tremendous thank you to both Karen and Katja because not not just for taking part in this evening, but you know there is an old saying that you can measure a society's um, development by how well it looks after its wild animals, and for people to actually specialize in a field of veterinary medicine where they're treating wild animals where inevitably the 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 certainty of, of a good salary and commercial success is is not taken for granted at all and is really really hard work so for for these ladies to to uh, take their careers down that particular um, uh, little side road I think is it deserves a, a great vote of thanks but most importantly of all to be actually spending time teaching both of them teaching nurses vets and uh, conservationists about how to look after and how to treat these wild animals is is really important and and I think I and and, and all the society and our profession owe a great debt of thanks and gratitude to both these ladies for what they do for wildlife so thank you both for that um, thank you. Th <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you, thank, yeah. thank you all for joining us. Um, and, and just to remind you that this webinar will be recorded. Um, and of course, you it is uh, will be an accredited CPD event, so you can get your CPD points for that. But it will appear on the F10 Products YouTube channel with the um, the the uh, access link on that first slide, which I showed you before. Um, if you have got any questions about this webinar or any of our other other webinars, do please send a message to health and hygiene at the link there um, and by all means get in touch with your local f10 distributor um, the details are, are on on the website so hopefully you found that good and useful we're taking a little bit of a break from these webinars um, through the winter period uh, but we will be back in 2022 with more topics if any of you guys have topics that you think would be particularly well uh, covered to, or good to address in these webinars do let us no, but we're certainly hoping hoping to cover some some equine and uh, and, and various other uh, subjects in in the near future. Um, if any of you got any questions right now, uh, then pop those in the um, uh, the questions tab on your uh, your presentation there. Um, so just looking at that, we've got some questions coming up now. So the first one is from Luca. Luca says, can F10 FC be used safely in aquatic wildlife species like turtles, amphibians, and fish? Can one use F10 bath to completely submerge them and limit handling? Um, and um, Someone say, yeah. So, so anyway, the simple answer is yes, you can. Uh, we do anticipate that we will be having a webinar in the future on the use of F10 products in aqua 
aquaculture in general, and that'll be both in uh, zoo wildlife and also commercial fish production. Um, so yes, it, it is a, a very exciting new field that we're working in, and we will be sharing that with you in the future. Just um, maybe Neil, to add, I've used it in, in frogs and toads. Yeah. Um, when they have wounds, we try and keep them out of the water so they dry. So we put sure. the ointment on for them. Yeah. And it yeah. works. Yeah. And yeah, as, um, as we have shared in both the zoo and the herpetology webinars, of course, mm -hmm. F10 is safe to use in the control of chytrid, Chytridium archaeus, which, of course, is the biggest global threat to amphibian populations across the world. Um, and the fact that we can actually use F10 uh, not only in adult, uh, but also in tadpoles um, means that, it, you know, it's really, really useful product in terms of setting up arcs for the preservation of threat and amphibian population so it, it is very very valuable in that that uh, respect and there's more details about that both in the the zoo and the herp uh, webinars but also on the health and uh, the f10 website as well okay so next question we have is just wondering if at least in some cases you can you compared f10 with other products for efficacy um, I guess I can answer that one. Um, the, the way that efficacy tests are done, um, if, if you are just testing a product to see that it is safe and it is effective, um, you don't compare it with other products. If you're doing a scientific uh, sort of academic trial where you're testing a new treatment for a disease, then yes, you would tend to test it against the standard treatment that already exists and compare the efficacy. But uh, no, that, that hasn't been done with F10 products. And that's basically because F10 has been funding their own research. Um, and of course, we do very much welcome and we, we have actually got a number of research trials now starting in academic institutions and we do welcome that. And so in future, that may well happen. Um, and then we got a question. We, we addressed that one earlier. That was about using uh, F10 with insecticides. Uh, are they okay for oxpeckers? That's good. Yes. Um, Maybe just to mention that the pink coloration in the in the ointment is food coloring, so it's completely edible. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, good, good point. Thank you. And then Floris um, uh, asked a question: the F10 when they set aside, can the patients lick it and still be okay? And the answer is absolutely fine. Yes, it's it's not an issue. Again, you know, we wouldn't be putting it on cats, so that's not a problem. But I and Karen's mentioned, and I'm sure catchers had a, a cases as well where you know it's it's put on with insecticide and patients do lick it, and absolutely no adverse effect at all. Um, Neil, I'm, I've used the F10 with insecticide in the lions, um, and okay. I've never had issues with it. But yeah. I think it's like just it's a big mass. You know, there's a little bit of insecticide, so sure. I've never seen toxicity yeah. in adult yeah. lion tigers so any of the pig yeah. species. I yeah. have no issues with it. I actually prefer it because of the insecticidal per, uh, properties. Sure. Sure. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's that's great news. And of course, Michelle Barrow is one of your predecessors at Johannesburg. She she made the same point herself. So, you know, we've got two very experienced veterinarians who both said that actually use cautiously and, you know, at, at a sensible application rate that, that there really isn't a, an issue. But uh, uh, so that's great news. So any other questions or any other comments? Any, any comments from Katja or Karen? Anything? Um, yeah. Maybe let, let me just ask one question for each of you. What is the single most uh, um, remarkable um, case where you've used F10 where you're you're really you were surprised or particularly chuffed at the outcome? I know you've shared some cases with us. It may be one of those. Maybe something else. Karen, mine you? was the mine was the burnt tortoise. Um, because we'd actually, we had two, well, we had seven burnt ones and we actually did a mini trial somewhere at the hospital where one, we used silver core to mm -hmm. see what, how long it would stay on. Um, it was great, but it didn't last as long as the F10. So sure. for me, um, and the response to that in the animal was in fantastic. So yeah. I, yeah. for me, that was my, the biggest for, um, success story for me. Okay. I, I, I have to I, say, I think your yellow billed kite was amazing as well. <laughs> the closure rate on that was just brilliant. Sorry, Katya, yeah. what's, what's your I think favorite? I'm going to stick with my flamingo. You know yeah. what? Um, Peaky yeah. wouldn't have made it any other way. And sure, yeah, sure, sure. For me, that was the most amazing one because yeah. we responded to treatment and we didn't actually have any hopes. Yeah, 
No, that's fun. We that's fantastic. We used to a lot of other ones where know, the bee was yeah. severely yeah. affected because yeah. they just couldn't eat and they were so painful. So sure. for him to pull through and actually be doing well and eating on us made it for me. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, ladies, thank you both very much indeed. I've, I've uh, very much enjoyed this evening and uh, getting this opportunity to not quite rub shoulders with you, but uh, to enjoy the, some of your successes. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's lovely that we all uh, share that uh, uh, great respect and, and love of wildlife cases. So thank you both very much indeed. Hope all the audience there, thank you for joining us. Hope you've enjoyed it as well. And remember, do have another look at the webinar on the YouTube channel and do share it with your friends. And um, thanks very much indeed. Thank you, ladies. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Take care. Bye.